but you will take your steps one after the other and you will get there in Jesus' name. God bless you, take your seat. Hallelujah. Amen. It's a good place to put your hands together and appreciate all my Dora, the visionary. Amen. Amen. Please take your seat. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering in your name. We thank you for the privilege of belonging to the kingdom of God. We pray that this morning our meeting will not be in vain. Amen. But as Mama Dora said, we shall leave here transformed. Amen. We shall leave here energized. Jesus. We shall leave here healed. Amen. We shall leave here charged to fulfill your purpose for our lives. Amen. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart Amen. be acceptable to you. Amen. Take these lips of clay and cause your anointing to cause your words, which are spirit and life, to flow to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I want to thank God for the opportunity. I deem it an honor to be asked to speak. Amen. amen. God could have chosen many vessels. So when it lands on you, you should know that you are not doing God a favor. Yeah. God is rather honoring you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I also want to appreciate Mrs. Tahia Boy, Mama Dora, for the conception of this vision and for continuing with it all these years and fighting so that other pastors' wives and women in ministry can be established in the things of God. And I pray that the Lord will strengthen you Amen. and your end will be greater. Amen. 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 Well, I also want to appreciate Bishop Taki Aboy. Because if he doesn't allow, he cannot be here. Amen. And many times he even comes to sit here with us. We are blessed to have somebody like this in our midst. So, Mama Dora, please appreciate the bishop for us. Amen. Amen. And thank you also for being here. Amen? Amen. And I pray that the word of God will fall on good soil. Amen. And it will yield much fruit. Amen. Amen. Well, Mama Dora gave me a topic like she told you. And the topic is, why worry? Why worry? So before I go to why worry, or in the midst of the topic, I want to ask us, what causes us to worry? What is it that causes a Christian to worry? Because I assume that you are all Christians. Amen? Is it a good assumption? Yes. Mm, okay. So I just want to read from Matthew chapter 6, from verse 31. Okay. No, let's go a bit, a bit later. 25. It's very um, popular and it's known. But we are not reading it today as a nursery rhyme. We are reading it as the word of God to us. Amen. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Another verse says, how many of you can add a cubit to your height? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither turn nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, 
was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, the unbelievers, seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows, he knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Amen. Amen. So what causes us to worry? One of the main things that causes us to worry is what we shall eat, what we shall drink, and what we shall put on. Amen? Amen. Sometimes it's the basic necessities of life that causes us to worry. If you haven't been there before, you may think, oh, but is this worth worrying about? But when you are starting in ministry, you know, I remember that my father-in-law gave us a one-bedroom apartment at the airport residential area. And I felt so blessed that he had given us that place. So when we moved in, then we started to arrange our things into my shop. I didn't have teaspoons, and I didn't know that you buy teaspoons, because I always saw them in my mother's house. I hadn't thought through it that you buy it before you have it. So when I did, I said, ah, we don't have teaspoons. And then my husband said, so we have to go and buy a few, maybe about four. And I remember being so shocked. Ah, so teaspoon to you buy it. Then he said that I should write down the things that are needed. The second was a dustbin. I didn't know that you buy ball out. I thought that it's just there. You know? So I was so shocked. I said, hey, so everything you have in the house is bought. Because I didn't know. You know, I just thought that oh, my mother brings it and every time she would be complaining. And this thing was a set. And the way people are going to school, you take it and I don't know. I don't even hear what she's saying. Like, what she's saying? What is her sex? But now, suddenly, I needed spoons. I needed a broom. I didn't even need to buy a broom. I mean, how do you process in that way? You understand? So we went out and we bought all these things. But our money was limited because we didn't have the kind of help I, in particular, thought we would get. Because our parents were against our entering the ministry, especially my husband. So then my father-in-law said, because you don't pay electricity, you don't pay water, you don't pay rent, that's why you say you want to do this thing full time. You don't know that it costs money. So I have to let it bite you, because he used to pay for us. But after a while, he came and said he's taking his flat back. Somebody wants to rent. Oh, we couldn't believe it. But when I look back, I say, ah, why wasn't I worried? Why didn't I cry? Why didn't I think that in me here, Mobo? Honestly, I think God just blessed me with naivety. Because I didn't have simple mindedness. I didn't know I was poor. It's not when I look back, it's, ah, then I was poor, but I didn't know. And I couldn't also go and tell my parents because they had said that what your husband is doing, you know, is not right. And my father-in-law used to call me every dawn and tell me, say, look, you don't have children now. I'm not bothered about my son. I'm bothered about you. Your future. You are there. You are a lawyer. The man is a doctor. He has come to say that now he's going to live off people's collection. That's how he put it. I mean that my son should live off people's collection. It's very sad to be bad, babe. In all of this, you are the one I pity. Think about it. What will your children eat? How will they go to school? How will they function? But in all of it, you know, in those days, there was a big divide between unbelievers and believers. So we thought and believed that we have the word. These people, they don't have the word. And they are not faith people. So, you know, 
we reject it and we cast it out and we just move on. Amen. And I think that God blessed me with simple mindedness because even though by the grace of God I didn't come from a place of need, I just felt that that's what it takes to obey God. You know, but when you have children also, now you're not thinking about just yourself. What, what, where would the fees come from? How would they go to school? You know, sometimes when you worry so much, you even get worried and you start to have pictures in your mind of the school that your children will go to and all that. So it's the things around us and the, the, the things that we need, the basic needs, which Jesus doesn't say is not important. Because in the, in the parable of the sower, he says that these are they who the word springs up, but the cares of this world. The cares. And the cares of this world are cares because they are things you are responsible for. Amen? And so you will easily feel tempted that you have to worry about these things. But like Jesus was telling his disciples, he said, how many of you by worrying can add a little span to your life. When you worry, are you able to extend your life? He's trying to tell you that you really don't have the power over a lot of things. You don't have the power to even make yourself taller. You know? So God is telling you that the reason why you worry is because you are thinking, what shall I eat? What shall I drink? What shall I wear? What does tomorrow hold for me? And many of you Young minister's wives, like Mama Dora was saying, you see us after 30 something years of ministry, and you have the wrong impression that that's how ministry starts. My husband says the only uh, job that starts from the top is grave digging and well digging. You start digging from the top, but there's no other job that is like that. You just have to know that God is faithful. Amen. So take no thought for your life. You know, sometimes maybe I'm preaching, you say, eh, you, you say take no thought for your life, but your life is very different from ours. So that's what my girl was telling you, that it has not always been like this. And it doesn't mean that when you grow in Christ, you don't have reasons to more worry. Rather, you have senior reasons to worry and senior things to deal with and senior battles to fight. Amen. But God will always comfort your heart. And God will show you that he's faithful. Amen. I remember I had to go to Switzerland to have my first child. Because in those days, National Service, six months, they have not paid you. And I had a work parent. So I went to Switzerland to work. But whilst I was there, the people said, oh, you can do in a stash. They call it in a stash. Like... You can do a complimentary something, and then you work with your professions. So what work does your husband do? I told them. And then because I was expecting a child, they wrote to me and said, we've given you this beautiful accommodation. Remember that I was receiving um, notices to be ejected from where I was. But now I was in Switzerland, and they were writing to me that because I was going to have a baby, they were going to give us a place to stay. They were going to help us to graduate from our professions into their kind of work, you know. So we'll be all right. In fact, I'd forgotten, but recently my husband was preaching. He mentioned it that when we went to register at the place that you registered, that you have come to be here, the very next week they started sending us brochures for yachts and boats and because... We had written that we are lawyer and doctor, so they knew that the level is another level. So they had already ahead sent us for yachts and boats and how we can pay monthly. And so when they gave us that place, then I said to my husband that, why don't we stay here? You know, women, you like Nyama Shosho. And I think that the reason is that when God created us, he put everything in place before we came. So when we came, the fish of the sea was there, the lights were there, the, the vegetation was there. So we, we seemed to uh, have that penchant to lean towards that. And then my husband said, no. I said, why? He said, because 
God has called me. I said, oh, God has called you. But your two friends are in Ghana, Bishop Saki and Bishop Adi. They can look after the church. And he said to me, no, I, I believe that it's me that God called. It's me he wants. So we have to give up this housing and we have to go to Ghana. And um, without sounding super spiritual, I thank God for the grace not to have fought and for the grace not to have been carnal. Amen. So we put the money, the little money we had together when we came, we bought our first set of furniture. And by God's grace, God provided for us, but it wasn't always easy. So take no thought for your life. The reason why we worry is because of basic life's necessities. Sometimes you people do, it's not basic. Sometimes you even have clothes, but you want another level. You are not realistic, and that leads to worry. And the Bible says, and they, comparing themselves with themselves, are not wise. Amen. Amen. So we worry because we, 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 we think about how, how are we going to take care of ourselves? How is our life going to be? How is God going to provide for us? And often, our eyes even switch from God to our husbands. And they become your provider. But that is wrong. It's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. Not the person you have married. God can bless you through those people. But God can bless you through also other channels. Amen. Amen. Job 30. Job 30 verse 27. Are we there? Job 30. Verse 27. We worry when things around us lead to inward turmoil. Job 30, 27. My inward parts are in turmoil and never still. Days of affliction come to meet me. I go about darkened but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and I cry for help. I'm a brother of jackals and a companion of ostriches. Amen. This is Job talking about his inward turmoils. So some of the things, you know, whenever you go to church, you look so together and you look as if everything is okay, but you worry because inside, there's turmoil. Something is eating you up. Sometimes the turmoil may be from somebody in the church. And unfortunately, you have to go to church every Sunday and every weekday, and you go and meet this, your penina, and it causes you inward turmoil. I mean, can you imagine Hannah living with this penina? The Bible says that she provoked Hannah saw so that she wept and did not eat. So some of us, we have handed over the leadership of our lives to another human being. And we have become like light torches. When the person switches on, you go on. When he switches off, you go off. So you are not being led by the Holy Spirit. You are not being led by the Word. You are being led by other human beings. But the Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God, not led by people, you know. And when a human being has control over you, there will be inward turmoil because it is like, does, does he approve of me? He doesn't approve of me. When he's happy, I'm happy. When he's sad, you are sad. When he criticizes, you are here. When he did, you are here. It can't be like that. And that leads to inward turmoil. And sometimes, especially in the ministry, you have no one to share your inward turmoils with. Because even when you try to go and share, you say, ah, you are talking about my pastor. You are saying bad things about my pastor. And you know, the pastor can never do wrong because he preaches to them every Sunday from the pulpit. And you, they don't hear you all the time. So the pastor is sanctified, but you, they are not sure about it. Okay, so the inward turmoils, which we don't also share, leads us to worry. 
and even leads to sickness and disease. You know, Hannah was so provoked, she will not even eat. When you don't eat when you should eat, you now be, begin to develop peptic ulcer. You believe, you, you begin to develop stress in your blood pressure and all that. And the person who is causing you this is lying on his boat somewhere and living his life. And you have allowed this inward turmoil not to come out, but to be like a sea that is in you. Beloved, these things ought not to be so. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 13, verse 12. I like to base everything as much as I can on the word of God because God's word is higher than my thoughts and my opinions. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 12, 13 says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. The third reason why we worry is because we are hoping for something and it keeps being deferred. You know, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And sometimes, you know, some people are hoping that the man will propose to you and he's not proposing. So that hope deferred is making your heart sick. Sometimes you are lusting over something like uh, 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 Thomas, the guy who raped Tamar, Amnon. He was lasting after time so much. The Bible says that he even fell sick out of it. And sometimes we have some strong lust and some strong desires for things that we should not have. And that leads us to sickness because what deferred makes the heart sick. Some of you have made yourself personal Holy Ghost in the life of your husband. And you have said that unless he does this, I will not be happy. Unless he treats me this way, I will not be happy. I am not saying he should abuse you, but I'm saying that there are certain things that we must not cast in iron. For instance, I just came from the Philippines and I was with a group of young people who worked for my husband. They came with him. And uh, they were saying that they wanted to go to town, but the males amongst them were not flowing. And then I came up and I said, look, their mother has given birth to them. They are like this already. They don't like shopping. Then now you go and marry them. You say by force, for you, romantic love is shopping. And the person says, I'm not able to go. Then all the good parts of your marriage, you throw away. And then because hope deferred makes the heart sick, you are following the hope that has always been pushed afar, is deferred. And also you have different backgrounds. You were brought up differently. So the person's views may be different from yours. It doesn't make him wrong. Amen. It just makes him different. Amen, ladies. Amen. For instance, I always say maybe in celebrating Christmas, in your house, Christmas, you visit family members. That's fine. In my house on 25th, my father locks the door, the main gates. And the way we are a lot, so we lay our table very long. And the whether you are house help, house boy, you are all part. And we do performances. I mean, we actually dance, we do drama, we have antennas. We have a lot of, when you knock on our gate, it will never open for you. And then we eat and eat and eat. Then 26, we open the gates, and then you can come. Now here I am, I married my husband, whose mother is Swiss. And Swiss people celebrate Christmas on the eve, 24th. 24th night is their Christmas. So you've come. Your hope is that Christmas 25th, your children will say anthems and all. It's not working. <laughs> and you are insisting so much because you want your way. The Bible says love does not insist on its own way. And because of that, your hope is always being defended. Amen. Maybe you have uh, uh, an idea of what is romantic to you. And your husband, to, to be romantic means to eat fufu. <laughs> I am not saying you should not nurture him. But I'm saying that when it consumes you, your hope is deferred and you are going to be sick. Amen, ladies. Amen. I hope I'm making sense there. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 7, verse 5. 
Second Corinthians 7, verse 5. This is Paul writing. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fierce within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. Amen. He's saying here that when they came into Macedonia, their bodies had no rest, but were afflicted at every turn. Amen. Sometimes ministry itself makes you worry. Sometimes ministry itself makes you frustrated. Sometimes ministry itself exhausts you. Amen. So Paul is in this, what he's talking about. He said, when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. Sometimes the issues that come up in ministry give you no rest. So many things to worry about. So many things to, every department, you have something to worry about. Amen? And some of you cannot even stand being talked about, let alone on Facebook. You just want to die. You want to disappear. And you are so worried that, eh, why are they writing this about me? And why are they saying this? And it's not true. And it's not this. So, oh, your small life that God gave you is being sucked out. And you are following people on Facebook, social media, and you are so concerned about what the world says. But Jesus said, if I yet pleased men, I will not be a servant of God. So you have to come to that place of maturity in the things of God. What does the Bible say? It says that God is a righteous judge and it's God who judges. All things are laid there before him. Amen. So again, you shouldn't allow somebody somewhere to turn his switch on and off. When he writes, then you won't eat like a liner. When he doesn't write, then you will be happy. When he doesn't say this, then you will be okay. But when he says this, you will not be okay. No. Paul said, our bodies had no rest. Within were fighting. Sometimes the fighters in the ministry are within. And especially what breaks our hearts is when you love people with all that you have. And then the ones you have loved the most turn against you. And it brings fightings within you. And sometimes you wonder, shall I be nice, shall I not be nice? Shall I flow, shall I not be flow? Can I be close to people? Can I not be close to people? Can I trust? Can I not trust? All that leads to fightings within. Amen. And if like Hannah, you live in the same house in Penina, in the same church, yeah, there's nothing you can do. And then sometimes you, you think you want a little TLC or understanding from your husband. So you tell him, oh, the way this sister behaves, I don't like, oh, what has she done? She's the most anointed person in this church. She's very helpful. If she was not in our ministry, how will it be? And you, you just sit there and then you complain. And then you go into your shell. Fighting with them, fighting with that. And now you become amateur in the church. You don't flow with anybody. You make your face. You divide the church into factions, but it's the kingdom of God. It's not the kingdom of your husband. It's not the kingdom of any human being. And so you have to be careful. Amen. And also, you can't make your husband into a woman. That's what I've come to see. You see, when a woman is walking and she's some way, maybe when she gets to you, she'll do this. Maybe she has some long hair, she'll do this. Then you tell her, did you see how she threw her? Which hair? Which hair is she threw? I didn't see any hair. Then you are worried because you need him to be on your side. But beloved, God says that Jesus is the only high priest who is touched with the feeling of our infirmity. Your husband may be your soulmate, but you cannot understand every fighting within. Amen. Look at what Elkanah came to tell Hannah. He said that, why, why don't you eat? Why is 
is your countenance sad? Why don't you eat? What makes you weep? Hannah would think, ah, but we are in this house together. When Penina sings and can say true and that's this, you don't hear, you don't see, and you are coming to ask me four foolish questions. Why is your countenance sad? Why do you weep? Why don't you eat? Am I not better to you than ten sons? You are not. Sons are different from husbands. Amen. But the only person who can understand that is Jesus. So we have to let the word of God work. We have to let the word of God be real. Beloved, the word of God is more real than your experiences. The word of God is more real than what any man will say. Who said that it cometh to pass when the Lord has not decreed it? Amen. How did Hannah overcome her problems? By getting a can on her side? No. By going into his presence and pouring out her heart to God, not to Elkanah. Because Elkanah is limited in what he even appreciates. Our bodies had no rest. There were fightings within and fears in the heart. Sometimes fears make us worry. We are afraid for our health. We are afraid for our husbands. We are afraid for the children. We are afraid for the church. We are afraid for the ministry. We are afraid for whatever is going on. And it leads us to worry. But you are not missing with us to carry all the problems of this world. You know the song says that, lay your troubles on my shoulder and put your worries in my pocket. Which pocket? It's only Jesus who is the high priest. He understands. So when we make time to go into his presence, like Hannah, we are able to pour out our hearts and we come back healed. Amen. Amen. Fightings within and fears without cause us to worry. Am I making sense here? Hmm. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 13. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 13. Hmm. Help us, Jesus. This is Paul. Let's read from 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from theirs into Macedonia. Amen. Sometimes it's even to preach or to do God's work, and that leads to a lot of turmoil and a lot of worry. I've counseled pastors' wives who just love God and want to serve him, but the husbands are not allowing them to do anything in ministry. I once counseled a lady, as soon as the church service is over, the husband says, take the children and go home. I don't want to see you here. And she wanted to do church work and all that, and he would rather be fellowshipping, with some lady who will be eating and this, and she should go. So I said to her, are the souls in Accra finished? She said, mommy, what do, you, what, what do you say? I said that after church, when you take the children out, away, come back to your vicinity and go with somebody and just start to win souls. Then you have a fellowship and you'll be able to pour yourself into people's lives. It doesn't always have to be end. Don't do it in a rebellious way. But you are looking for work. She was in the choir. She was removed. So Paul was saying that as I came to preach the gospel, there were a lot of things that I didn't make me have rest. So ministry can be a thorn. Ministry can be painful for the pastor's wife. And ministry can be a place that you walk away from and never come to again because you feel that every time we go to Shiloh, Penina comes with her children. So why should I go to Shiloh when my saw is so raw and Penina will just be pouring acid into my saw? But sometimes your place of pain is your place of deliverance. Your place of pain is your place of maturity. Your place of pain is what God will use to bring you through. So we don't look at just pain. The Christians of today, we are led by pain and offenses. The Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, not your pain, not your offenses. And that 
will lead us not to worry. Amen. Amen. Why worry? This is the causes of worry. So now I want to talk about why worry. Why worry when it is a dead situation? Why worry when it is a dead situation? Genesis 23 verse 4. Well, I'm not looking at the time, so. Genesis 23, verse 4. This is Abraham. Sarah has died, and he says, I'm a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Amen. Amen. That I may bury my dead out of my sight. Come with me to Deuteronomy 34. I'll tie it in there. Deuteronomy 34. That I may bury my dead out of my sight. 5 to 9. So Moses, of the, oh, so Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of this of his sepulchre unto this day. And Moses was 120 years when he died. Verse 8. And the children of Israel wept for Moses 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. Then now when you come to Joshua 1 verse 1, after this chapter is just Joshua 1 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all these people, unto the land which I do Amen. give thee. Amen. Amen. Some of us, we sleep with dead bodies every night. Things that are dead. Things that happened some time ago. Things that don't have life, and you want to give them life again. But Abraham said, give me a burying place that I may bury the dead out of my sight. Why worry when the situation is dead? The man should not have, but he has left you anyway. He has moved on. He has gone to marry somebody else, whatever it is. You may not like it, but it is a dead situation. You cannot resurrect what is lost. You cannot resurrect what is gone. And like the children of Israel and Joshua, they mourned for Moses 30 days, but they stayed in the same place and they couldn't progress. So God had to come to them in Joshua 1 and said, look, now Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go forward into the promised land. Why worry when that situation is dead? Why worry when that situation is not going to come back? Why worry when it has happened anyway? Amen, ladies. Some of us, we do necromancy. Necromancy is talking to the dead. You're always talking to the dead situation. And then, we yeah, will be. Every day you want to remember. Says, ah, dear, 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 dear. Then you cry. Ah, dear, dear. It's dead. It has no life, and it, has, it hasn't got the right to keep you in that place where you mourn for Moses. God is saying the key of acceptance, accept that it has happened, accept that it was horrible, but accept also that it is dead and it is gone, and look to the future, to what God has in store for you. Amen, ladies. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. When you keep looking back, you have an accident. Nobody drives and keeps looking in the rear mirror. It doesn't take us anywhere. Why worry when your situation is a no longer? Why worry when your situation is a no longer? Exodus 2 verse 2. And the woman conceived and bare a son when she saw him that he was a goodly child. But she hid him three months, and when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and dubbed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flax 
by the river's brink, and his sister stood afar off to wait what will be done to him. Amen. Moses' mother was living under a very oppressive regime. And the Pharaoh there had said that all boys should be killed from birth. They shouldn't live. And she, the Bible says, by faith, you know, Moses' mother took him and hid him. So by faith, she took Moses and hid him. But after three months, the baby has now grown. He's not just having breast milk. He's having serilac and even sometimes banku. You know, so she could no longer hide him. So she had to, she had no choice than to make a wicker basket, put her Moses in it, and leave it in a very dangerous place. There are things in your life that you, it is no longer. You can no longer hide, you can no longer nurture, you can no longer have it. Put it in a basket and trust it to God. The river, you may be afraid that it will drown the baby, the baby can die, anything can happen, but recognize you're no longer. Because when you recognize you're no longer, it makes you a peaceful person. Amen. Some of you, your homes are World War II. Because things that you can no longer do, you are still fighting to do. Amen, ladies. Amen. But sometimes, when you recognize you can no longer, that is even what God will use to turn your husband towards you. But if every time you are going to nod, Oh, yes, sir. And I will say, and I will say, and the one I, 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 I counsel you about, you say, but it's the truth. That's why I'm saying we shouldn't speak the truth. The Bible says, speak the truth in love. The Bible says, there's a time for everything. The Bible talks about a word fitly spoken. So when you can no longer control the situation, you can no longer do anything, yield that baby on that river and see what God will bring it to come to pass without you. Amen. When she could no longer hide him, she just put him on the river. It's like, some of you, you have to walk to rivers and you have to put whatever it is into a wicker basket. You have to put it on the river. It could drown. The baby could die. Anything could happen. But you have to come to a place of trust so that God can take things up. From there. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 9. Hmm. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 9. You see, we believe that God answers prayer. We believe in Philippians 4, 6, have no anxiety, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. All that is true. But in your walk with God, you will come to places that you will wrestle with him over certain prayer topics. And it will be like he's not taking it away. So this is Apostle Paul. He said, for this thing, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen, ladies. Paul, the apostle who had been to the third heavens, Paul, who met Jesus face to face. You, you have not even heard Jesus' voice yet. Paul, who was taken to the Arabian desert and taught by God, according to Galatians 1. He said that he had a prayer topic. And for this, he besought the Lord three times. And God will not bring the answer. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So the things that you worry about, some of them, they'll never be answered. Because God is not working on the other person. He's working on you. He's working on bringing you to a certain place. It is uncomfortable, but it is for your good. Amen. 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 So Paul said, for this I besought the Lord three times that it will be taken away from me. And what was his answer? My grace is sufficient for you. 
Grace, you will come to know what the grace of God is. You always read it, you share grace, but you don't know what it is. But when you have a situation like this, and you beseech him all the time, your prayer, and no answer. And then he comes to say, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. He says, when you are weak, then are you strong? Amen. Amen. So the things you are worried about with my bonfire, I've paid vows, I've paid offering. God is not what a, maybe it's a, a, my grace is sufficient for you situation. Amen, Amen ladies. Amen. <laughs> it's not easy, but we have to go through it. That's how it is. Why worry when it's not your battle? 2 Corinthians 20, 15, God said to Jehoshaphat, for the battle is the Lord's and not yours. You see, some of us, battles that are not ours, we have gone for, and we have put our names and ribbons on it, and we have put our address, send it to me. It's my battle. Amen? And God has to come and tell you that this battle is not yours. It is the Lord. Because you are always fighting over parcels that are not for you. And you are always wanting to address parcels to your address. Every time they bring you, return to sender, and you still want the battle. But God is saying, the battle is his and not yours. Amen. I remember when I was going to have one of my children, and the church had acquired the rubbish dump by it in Polygon. And we were going to do a slab salt cutting. So we all went to church. The neighborhood was going to do a slab cutting. We we're going to use it as a car park. And we we're going to rebuild the public toilet, which by the way exploded. It was a sign that we went all right. But when we got there, the people in the area, Polygon, said, No, we don't understand. And there was a whole ruckus over that. Anyway, the service ended. I hung around a bit and I had to go and take my children home. So I was going to my husband's office, which was then upstairs, to tell him I was leaving. Then I met a woman who was part of the community and she was crying. And she said that if you, I was pregnant, she said, if you want to have this baby, leave the dustbin alone. And she was crying. You know, the Bible says, Belzebub, the Lord of the flies. You know where? Rubbish is. You know, we have been told in the realm of the spirit that it's their place of meeting and convocations. You know, so I said, in Jesus' name, I'll have this baby. She said, eh, hey, or bad way. So anyway, I went home and I was really shaking inside. I was worried. Hey. Just walking, somebody I don't know. Eh? Eh, eh, eh. Public issues become your private issues in ministry. Why? Anyway. So, I was still shaking inside, and then I decided to just pray because that's all I, I had to do. I didn't have any other weapon. So, I prayed, and then my husband came in the night, and then I told him, and he prayed with me. But after he had prayed with me, sister, I was still worried. So I went to the next room and I was telling God, you know, what this woman said, you have to look after this baby for me, prove them wrong, whatever, anyway. Now, every time I have children, there's no cutting, no, God knows I don't have time. You understand? So they just come and then I go. But this particular one, everything went well. And then, as they are taking the baby and all of that, the resident uh, doctor came and said, I think we are detecting some internal bleeding. We may have to take you to the theater for surgery. But before then, this particular baby had delayed a bit because I don't delay so much, like a week or so. So I decided I should go and have a test for the baby's heartbeat. And then they didn't say anything. They just said, we'll send you the results at Trust Hospital. So I was given the envelope. So I went for Tuesday service. I showed it to one of our doctors. 
No, I didn't show. I said that if you go and do a tour program and you have this over this, is it a bad thing? It's not good at all. Oh. Then she saw that my face had fallen. Oh, mommy, is it you? <laughs> and I said, yes, it's me. So, no, no, sometimes they can do this, or sometimes you know, they can do that. And then after that, well, I went into labor, and then they came to say, oh, it seems there's some internal bleeding. My mom was there, and then uh, my husband was also there, and the midwife came to tell me, don't worry, Bishop is walking behind the wall. Not trunk so bonny. Now who put on that woman was a believer. So anyway, the, when the doctor said that, then my husband said no. He wants the opinion of the consultant before he will allow me to go to surgery. And my mother was there, so she came to the room and said, "Who could not let this new child die down? I don't see. My husband's medicine. He stopped long ago. Why is he now dictating to the people that they should?" And I said, no, he knows what it's about. He's licensed, so don't worry. But anyway, I was thinking, God, you promised me. So I was prepared and I was wheeled into the theater. So I was under that big light. And then the consultant walked in. When the consultant walked in, he examined me. And then he turned to the resident and said, why is she here? Wheel her out. The God of the king said, out. I was dressed and everything like this said you get. So the battle is not yours. And because of where we stand, the types of battles, you see, you won't understand till you are there. Oh, don't worry, You will not understand. You think that ministry is lace and nice hair, and nice fascinator like Amadora. And you never go, oh, did you do any cake? Why? Amen. Amen. So the battle is, uh, is not ours. Now, how do we overcome worry? How do we overcome worry? Psalm 37, verse 7. Psalm 37, verse 7. Okay, Psalm 37. I'm running to the finishing line. Psalm 37, verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Actually, Psalm 37 is one of my favorite verses. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now, Hebrews 4.1 talks about rest. And a lot of you worry because you are not able to enter into his rest. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. Hmm. How to overcome worry. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise be left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. So even entering his rest is work. He says, let us be careful. Let the promise of entering into his rest, it doesn't happen to us because we are not able to rest in the Lord. Amen, ladies? Amen. Let us therefore fear. <laughs> Let a promise be left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of. Hmm? So we need to learn to rest in the Lord. And we rest in the Lord because God himself rests. Amen? Amen. God, the Bible says he created everything in six days and on the seventh day he rested from his works. How come you in your life there's no rest? Everything depends on you. Everything you have to work it out. Everything you have to know. Everything you have to... Why? Why? They that have entered into his rest, the Bible says, have ceased from their own works. Fret not thyself because of evil doers. Neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity. Rest in the Lord. And wait patiently for him. Beloved, let us learn to rest 
in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hmm. Rest in his word. Rest in his word. Second Corinthians 32. Hey, 3. No, Second Chronicles 32, sorry. Second Chronicles. I hope you know the books of the Bible. Hmm. Second Chronicles 32. Are you there? Verse 8. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Hezekiah was speaking to them, was ministering to them, was ministering God's word to them. And he said, with him is the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord God to help us to fight our battles. And the people rested on Hezekiah's word. When a word is preached, do you rest on it? When the word comes from, do you rest on it? Say, mm, I need a Bible to chair. I said, no, I hear you. Put the Bible aside and let's be real. Sometimes when people say, how do you go through this? I say, it's the grace of God. Oh, we know grace. We are talking about how. <laughs> and the people rested on the word of Hezekiah. Does church do anything different for you? When you hear his word, like in a meeting like this, does it make anything change? Do you rest on the word of God's servants? Do you? Or your worry is like, you always have to take it up and put it on your head. Rest in his word. And then get through things by godly comfort. Godly comfort. Second Corinthians 7, verse 6. I think we even read it. Second Corinthians 7, verse 6. Paul is talking. From verse 5, he says, When we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We read that. Fightings within fears without. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us now by the coming of Titus. So God gives you support groups in your life. The coming of a human being, the presence of a human being in your life can make a difference. You can't go it alone. You need a support group. Amen, pastors' wives. Paul said that we had fighters within fears with that, but God comforted us by the coming of Titus. By you, when your Titus comes, you say, we didn't show to me yet. We didn't show show. What is she coming to add to it? But God is comforting you through your worry, through the coming of Titus, but you are not recognizing your Titus. Even this meeting, it's a Titus meeting. Amen. God is sending you support through a ministry like this. Through a vision like this, God is sending you support. God has sent me support through Senator Jakes. Yes. And through so many other women of God. Because sometimes people cannot relate to where you are. Do you understand? But she preached a message long ago. Prisoners of the gospel. Go and look for it to YouTube. It will change your life forever. Prisoners of the gospel. Amen. So the coming of Titus, the coming of a woman of God, the coming of a man of God, the coming of somebody should bring you comfort. By you, you don't share your things with anybody. You are an island. You are an island. And how can you carry all the troubles of this world and put the worries in your pocket? It's not going to work. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Get through by godly support. Okay, and then lower your expectations. Lower your expectations. Are you there? Lower your expectations. First Thessalonians 2, 17 to 18. First Thessalonians 2, 17 to 18. But we, brethren, be taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, 
endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ as is coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Then chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left alone at Athens and sent Timothy, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. What Paul is saying is that we wanted to come to you so much. We had a strong desire to fellowship with you. But when it didn't work, Satan was hindering us. We decided that we will be left alone at Athens and rather we will send Timothy. Make adjustments in your life when things don't work. Make adjustments in your life when an expectation is not met. Some of you, your expectations are, they don't even exist on this world. You have watched movies, uh, so unless your husband behaves like that movie, he's not loving. Amen? But you can adjust your life. For instance, when I first got married, we would be in church, we do ministry together, and then sometimes your husband will travel, which he still does, for crusades, for this, for this. If you're going to think about it, hey, the house is quiet too. So is that how I live my life? I didn't sign up for this one. All the children have gone. Look how home is quiet. Is this ministry is troubling me? How can I hey, adjust? Begin to get involved in the work of God yourself. Begin to find something to do, like the virtuous woman. She considers a field and she buys it. She goes to the merchant ships. She stretches out her hand to the needy. Her life is also filled with fulfillment. So she is not there meditating on. He is not there, and if he comes, the face I will even give him, he will return to his church and all this. Adjust. Adjust. You are your expectations. Amen, ladies. Somebody said, Me, I grew up with my mother, my father, my uncles, and all. So this bungalow that they brought me in, it's in my baby. I don't know these things. You don't know these things. You will know these things. <laughs> Rest in the course of your journey. Numbers 9, 18 to 23. I'm about ending. Numbers 9, 18 to 23. Rest in the midst of your journey. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched as long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. Amen. Then I'm saying, be involved, do this, do that. But sometimes your worry and your unfulfillment is also because you don't take time to rest. You don't take time to do the things that make you happy, which, by the way, I hope are godly. You don't take time to even go out with a friend. Have lunch with a friend. Do something that gives you rest on your journey and in your work with God so that you don't put too much pressure on the man God gave you. Amen, ladies. So look in your life. What gives you fulfillment? What makes you happy? What will be rest for you? Sometimes you should go to a spa if you can afford it. Amen? Amen. And when they start to massage here, massage, they say, hey, it's all stress. They say, really? I didn't know. Sometimes you should give yourself a manicure or a pedicure. Pamper yourself. Rest on the journey so that you will be healthy. Amen. Amen. Every day you organize it. Every day you are spending for others. Every day it's time to also have rest on your own journey. Amen, ladies. And it doesn't take money to chill. Even the woman with the manicure on her head, bro, you can afford it. Amen, ladies. <laughs> Fight your battles on your knees. 
Fight your battles on your knees. Jeremiah 9, verse 17. Fight your battles on your knees. Amen, ladies. That says the Lord of hosts, consider ye and call for the morning women that they may come. And send for coming women that they may come. And let them make haste and take up a wailing for us that our eyes may run down with tears and our eyelids gush out with waters. Amen. Amen. Fight your battles on your knees. Verse 20. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth and teach your daughters wailing and everyone her neighbor lamentation for death is come up into our windows and is entered into our palaces. Amen. God is saying, call ye, consider, and call the wailing women. Instead of always wailing about what you don't have, always wailing about what you have lost, turn your tears into intercession. Turn your tears onto your knees and let God make a difference. Amen. Amen. Hannah was prayerful. That's how she got the breakthrough. Hannah well, didn't do anything for her. Amen. She went, and even as she was trying to do her best, she almost got offended because Eli said, the way you are talking, you are a drunkard. So put away your drink. Some of you, you would have forgotten about what you came to pray about. So we say, we are suffering. We are suffering. And I can't perform answer. You talk about people. Today, you say, I'm a drunkard. You say, you are a man of God. You see wrongly. And you just get up. The miracle will be through the window. Because Satan has been able to distract you. But the Bible says, looking unto Jesus. Not looking unto your circumstances. Not looking unto your situation. But looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Amen, ladies. Fight your battles on your knees. Amen. And you see, it will surprise you how God will come to you. It will surprise you how God will come to you. The topics that you cannot mention to anybody, mention on the process. And see God bring you through in an amazing way. Amen. Let them call for the wailing women and let them wail. Amen, ladies. Hmm. Fight to change the situation. Lastly, fight to change the situation. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Beloved, this life is a fight. Faith is a fact. The fact that he has promised doesn't mean there will not be any facts. You see, Abraham, God said, I will make you like the sun. I will make you like the stars. I will do. He didn't tell him that there will be wars. He didn't tell him that Sarah will give him Hagar and they will have a domestic issue. He didn't tell him that the kings of Sodom and things will rise up against him. He didn't tell him that Lot will be unfaithful to him. He didn't tell him what I just said, oh, to a land where I'll show you, just go. So, beloved, we have to also, it's not every day, say, hmm, it's okay, God will fight. Some of the fights, you have to fight it yourself. Amen, ladies. Hmm. Judges chapter 5. And I'm ending on this note. Judges chapter 5. 6 to 7. Judges 5, 6 to 7. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied. And the travelers walked through byways. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose. At times when you have to arise as a woman and make a difference. And that will take away what you worry about. Amen, ladies. He said that at the time, people were not even traveling on the highways. Israel was in turmoil. There was fear until I arose, Deborah. So
So there are times when you also have to arise in a given situation. Amen, ladies. Yeah. I arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. There were war in the gates, but she arose. Then there was there a shield of spear seen among 40,000 in Israel. She arose when there were wars in the gates. There are times God expects you to do something about what is happening so that your worries will be kept. Amen? Amen. But usually it will not be a selfish rising up. She arose a mother in Israel. Amen, ladies. So it's not every time your battles are on your knees, but there are times when you also have to act. Amen. Amen. And then, six to seven, in the days of Shanga, okay. Then 12 of the same. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinor. Some of you are asleep. And you can make a difference by rising up. Look at the Yas and Twist of our days. Look at Deborah of the judges. She was the wife of Lepidoth. She was a wife. She was a judge. She was the mother of Israel. And she sat under the tree to judge Israel. Amen. Some of you, as soon as you married, you became the wife of Lapidot. Everything ended. But you have to arise as Deborah. Because God has put a deposit in you. God has put something in you to fight. And to make warfare. And to say, I'm not giving in. I'm arising. Awake, awake. Oh, Deborah. There's a Deborah in you. Amen, ladies. Amen. It's not every time. There are some things that you have to fight for. Amen, ladies. And God has to give you wisdom and discernment to know which fight you are fighting. Some of you, every time we are working at Mapola, you are fighting the KJT and you are fighting the... That is not a good fight. You are so quarrelsome. Everybody will pair you up in church. It's a problem. And you always think it's the other person. But when you look at the statistics, you should see that there's something you have to correct in you. Amen, ladies. Amen. Awake, awake, Deborah. Let the Deborahs amongst us arise. Amen. Let the Deborahs in us arise Amen. and solve situations and change things. And I believe that God will bring us to a good place. Why worry? God bless you. Please stand to your feet. Every eye closed, every eye closed.